Hi everyone, uh, this is your host Murat Tunaboylu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Antiverse. Thank you very much for joining for another episode of Future of Drug Discovery. This session, uh, we have Nikhil joining us from BIX, this Boringer Ingelheim's digital solutions, uh, digital lab team. He's uh, heading that department and he's also part of the digital innovation leadership team. We are uh, very excited to uh, get into a couple of different things that he is working on right now. Um, Nikhil, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Murat. Nice to, nice to join you guys. So I will straight uh, jump into it. Would you mind telling for some of our audience that may not know you that well, what were the key decision points in your life that led you to BIX? Good question. <clears throat> well, I think the first one goes to uh, my first job, to be honest. It's it's a good accident and uh, I really like that it happened. So uh, after my master's uh, in Chicago, uh, I was looking for a, a gig back in 2007, 2008, which was a tough time. And that's when I accidentally found a Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics at Columbia. It was a uh, best accident which happened and uh, a pleasure one because I, I got into life sciences back in then started doing machine learning and data science um, I never looked back the second one I would refer to is after working about a decade in states and working at Columbia NYU and Stanford I decided to move to Europe it was a strange decision to many <laughs> But I'm glad I moved. So I got <clears throat> I moved to Berlin, uh, stayed there, and never really went back. So I think these are the two big decisions. The third one, which brought me to BIX, was working in different sectors and different geographies. Uh, I worked in aerospace uh, manufacturing. Uh, but at some point, I realized that life sciences is the most challenging one, uh, which uh, kept me awake, I would say. <laughs> So uh, I decided to come back and BIX was there, uh, one of the offers, so I took it up. So it was uh, it was a good thing to join BIX uh, in 2021. And uh, yeah, as you mentioned, I lead the BIX data science team across geographies in China, in Germany, uh, and then also a part of the leadership team of Digital Innovation Unit uh, for BI. And that BIX team, how does it integrate into the whole BI thing? I know you guys do a lot of interesting stuff, like um, pet healthcare, even uh, animal welfare, some work with uh, detecting the early signs of Alzheimer's, um, target identification to lead optimization, pretty much everything under the sun. So how big is the team? Uh, in which parts of the process that you sit in? How do you work, how do you work with other departments? Good question. Um, so a bit of history, I guess. So uh, in 2016, one of our board members, our CFO, Mike Schmelmer, uh, he's he's the as I say, uh, godfather of BIX per se. So it's his idea to uh, build a digital lab for Boringer to accelerate overall digital transformation. So uh, he took it up on himself and he put together a team uh, now that team is about 100 people across two locations uh, in Germany as well as in Shanghai. Uh, we are not just talkers, we are pretty much doers, the engineers, data scientists, UX, UI, uh, different backgrounds, uh, physics, chemistry, biology. And the way we work is pretty simple. Anybody within the company who has an idea can raise their hand and simply say, hey, can we work with you guys to develop this idea? That's it. And the only thing we ask the company or the business unit, be it uh, human pharma or animal health, is a product owner. So if you have an idea, come up with us, be a product owner or nominate one, and the rest is taken care of. So we do budget, we provide the budget, headcount, and everything else that goes with it. That is the reason you see uh, products across different sectors, animal health, human pharma, R&D, internal, external, across geographies. Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit of story of uh, BIX. And on top of that, we've been increasing the presence externally. It's not just working with internal ideas. How can we 
get the latest and greatest ideas from the academy or the industry or startups? How can we collaborate with them? How can we partner with them? And how can we put a product into the market as soon as possible? That's something which we look into actively. Okay. Well, it's a, it's one of the biggest groups I've been talking to with 100 people. But it is the drug discovery space, it is still quite big. If you want to even digitalize the R&D for target identification to lead optimization to all the way to clinic, there's just so much to do. How do you, what's your thought process when it comes to buy versus build? Well, so one of the mandates for BIX is uh, work on the disruptive ideas. So as you know, it's a big company and there's there gonna be many ideas. And we also have our information technology, brilliant folks. Uh, they also work on a lot of interesting products. Um, so there was a, actively there was a distinction made from BIX and the information technology group saying, or even the rest of the group saying, uh, BIX works on disruptive products, disruptive ideas. So our idea selection is one of the things which we really focus on. Uh, is it something which is really for us? Uh, once we do, that uh, we focus on time brackets. So if we, we go to the discovery phase in a month, testing out if it's something which looks good on the paper to begin with, it's something which can be achievable. And then we go through the similar phase of MVP pilot and then scale up and then hand it over the product back to the uh, parent company. So we don't run the product once we put it in the market. It still goes back to the bigger company that is Boringer. Now, um, does that work for every product? Uh, not true. Again, there are different ball game. If you're looking at identification of targets compared to putting a digital health product in the market, different products and different skill set and different timelines. So we are also uh, pragmatic in the terms. So we decide when we really uh, based on the need uh, and then move ahead. But the, we spend a lot of time picking the ideas we work on. That's that's probably the biggest. Uh, a focus area for us uh, is it something which you really want to do is it something we and it's also very contentious within the company if you turn down something then you still have to go talk to them the next day on a different product or a different idea or if you take on something which is not a focus for a business unit we really also there's it, it's also a contentious topic why is bis working on something which is not really a focus for uh, uh, a business unit so that's a thin line and we try to uh, work it as carefully as possible I hear you. I know there are a couple of very interesting examples of the work you do, but if you were to pick one or two, what would you like to highlight? So I would pick one internal and one external product. Um, my favorite lately has been in the domain of drug discovery or target identification. So the idea itself came from the computational biology folks within Boringer, a brilliant group. Uh, they are uh, growing very fast, and it's a it's a it's a very exciting field, as you know. Uh, the idea was pretty simple: uh, can we back translate into biobanks using uh, long read data from Oxford Nanopore, and can we identify structural variants which are uh, causing, uh, you know, which which are causing a phenotype to be uh, affected? Right now, this seems very simple <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> You can describe it in like 15 seconds. Uh, however, to put together a reference panel and sequencing, I don't know, thousand samples coming from thousand genome project, making sure the quality of the data is right, putting together, assembling the all the samples, and then imputing back to the biobank, right? It's a it's a lot of work, and you want to be really careful with regards to overall quality of the data you're getting and the overall imputation matrix. And then once you have the structural variants, uh, validating them. Uh, the team was a cross-functional team, as I mentioned. There are computational biologists, people from BIX, data scientists, engineers, product owners. And they did that in about eight months, which was a phenomenal uh, in this regards, uh, especially when it involves sequencing and then uh, you know validating the data and sampling. So that was that's one of my favorites, and we did get a lot of structural variants, which are uh, uh, 
which we are taking into the validation phase right now. And we already see something really exciting. The team is really busy publishing a paper. Uh, so probably that paper should be out pretty soon. That's something which was really, really exciting for me over the last six months. The second one is uh, Consanas Digital, which is for the Shanghai market in China. Mm -hmm. So uh, Consanas Digital takes uh, stroke care to the next level. So it's it's very common. It's, it's well known that the stroke care in Germany is uh, considered one of the best. So the team came up with an idea. How can, can we put together a product where we can take German stroke, uh, stroke or uh, stroke care for Chinese market. So uh, we worked with different partners as well as with people from BIX to put together a digital product which takes care of uh, stroke patients or a rehab of the stroke patients. And it is something uh, which is launched on a big scale. Uh, it is a digital health solution. And because of Chinese regulations, we also had to build an internet hospital. Literally, we had a, we built up in a hospital uh, in, in, in China with about 70 beds uh, and then released the application uh, just because it's part of our regulations. So that's also something which we're really, really proud of. And it's already in the market and we already have subscribers and it's growing very fast. The coolest part was it's not just BIX that worked on it. We also have partners uh, coming from outside in the Chinese uh, in the Chinese market. So we also work with the likes of Alibaba and a few other vendors to bring together different components. Uh, it involves speech recognition. It involves gesture recognition and uh, many other components which were really really uh, brought together. So that's also something which makes me really proud. And I'm also very uh, satisfied with the work that's been done in the both in our Chinese uh, in Shanghai uh, uh, location as well as in, in Ingelheim. That's amazing. I have a few other follow-up questions on that but uh, I want to take a second here some of the for the some of the new audience never used their meet before there's a chat function uh, if you look up the top right hand section there's people next to that, there's messages. Under messages, you will see there are a couple of different options. One of them is Q&A, uh, the other one is chat. So please feel free to put any questions you might have for Nikhil under the Q&A section. And uh, when we uh, finish our session in about five, 10 minutes, uh, if there are any uh, questions there, we will, we will revert to Nikhil. Thank you. So this. This application in China, I mean, you had to <laughs> set up in even a hospital with 70 beds and so on. Can you tell us more about what does what does post-stroke care entail? Well, um, many things, I guess. Uh, so there are different uh, varieties per se. Uh, it's so once a patient has been discharged after the uh, after they have stroke they fundamentally work on rehabilitation. It does involve uh, physical exercises, but also uh, speech exercises or speech therapy, right? So um, the team focused on uh, recording a lot of this physical uh, exercises, uh, as well as uh, speech therapies, uh, and then making sure that the patient is also following these particular exercises online. And not only following, but also correcting their poses as they go through diff uh, different levels. Mm -hmm. And all of these are monitored by a, a therapist who is sitting in uh, on the other side of the screen. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and then prescribing the next uh, next exercises for the patient based on the development and so on and so forth. So it's it's not just uh, watching videos, but also going through the uh, gesture corrections and also uh, looking at the overall development of the patient and then prescribing what would be the next one in the in the line. So that's something which was uh, which we had to think through again and again because the recommendation engine for, I don't know, thousands of exercises uh, need to be really, really thought through uh, based on the progress of the patient and how you're prescribing the next one. So uh, and with regards to the speech therapy, again, that's also something like looking at uh, 
like your speech recognition and how well they are doing and how how can you prescribe different syllables or different uh, words so that they can gain the feel, uh, the speech as uh, as they had before they had a stroke right so that's something which we also uh, uh, provide as part of the suit stroke suit mm -hmm. okay and um you you mentioned that you had to still you know go through the regulatory approval for the release of that uh, deployment of that technology how does it work when you have to come up with a new version or a fix a bug or you know do you have to go through the whole process again i imagine not well uh, so the field is called software as a medical device samd uh, it's i mean for the rightful reasons it's uh, because if, if there's a mistake, you're putting people's lives at risk. So you better be careful on what you're putting in the market and how it's being used and so on and so forth. So uh, ASAMD has a guide, a clear guidance on how you develop the product and what are the overall quality regulations that you follow. And you also have to have a quality management system for the code. And that has to go through uh, overall verification uh, and get an approval. So. Uh, that's before you put a product in the market, right? But once you have put the product in the market, you have a thing called post-market surveillance. How are the models doing? Are they degrading? Are they still doing well? Uh, how are you handling complaints coming from the patients? Uh, how are you, you know, all of these things needs to be taken care of. And there's a very good framework and probably we can talk about it for a few hours, uh, different ISO standards and so on and so forth. So it's, it's not as simple uh but again this was one of the first products which we had to go through and uh it was completely worth it because uh, it now we are very much aware of what we have to focus on developing different products across different markets and we have a pipeline where we have uh, about three or four samd products for different markets north america canada also in germany so uh yeah learning by doing that's amazing um going back for a second to the internal project example you had that you spent about eight months with a cross-functional team including computational biologists to look for long uh read sequences to identify i think the structural uh variabilities that might be associated with different indications that's the hope um my first question, why does computational biology group doesn't, they, they, they don't sit under BIX, correct? They don't, they don't. Um, so it's, it's also one of the contentious products when we took it up, to be honest. Uh, it's in the beginning, it was essentially, P, uh, there was also a debate saying that, okay, this is completely computational biology. Why do we have to join data scientists? Uh, and I've been one of the biggest uh, force behind to get this into BIX for the simple reason that I strongly believe when you put together science and tech, great things happen. Uh, it's And just because I'm part of the digital innovation unit, uh, and it, I was really convinced that we can do it just at computational biology group or just in BIX, but doing it as a part of the you know cross-functional team will get us faster uh, and further <laughs> in the time we have. And this was one of the experiments which we wanted to do, uh, to be honest, let's see how far we can go in this such a drug discovery projects. And we worked before on drug discovery projects, uh, mostly in computational chemistry, uh, identifying different molecules and re recommending molecules and so on and so forth. Um, but this was going more into the uh, uh, foundational research. But still, uh, that was a, so it was one of the experiments and it turned out to be really good. Uh, one thing we noticed was people who are coming from R&D were really learning from data scientists uh, on latest techniques. How do you make sure everything goes uh, well? How are you structuring pipelines? How are you getting different models working together? And my team within BIX also, there are PhDs from, uh, they have PhDs in physics, mathematics, chemistry. It's not like they're, they don't know uh, how research works. So they also know very much how it looks and how it works. So 
bringing this team and you know letting them be to be uh, and letting letting just telling them that you know what this is what we want to do and this is a this is a overall goal uh get yourself together uh, let's see how far we can go it just turned out to be fantastic so uh in fact as part of this product uh, we put together a um we had to develop a reference panel using long read sequencing data and we used oxford nanopore sequencing i, I came to know that uh, we are the only pharma company uh, which has such a reference panel in the world and we are the first one to do it and the only other institution which has is in finland finjen i guess they have a re- reference panel but it's not uh, diverse it's pretty much coming from uh, homogeneous samples in uh, in finland so there were lots of firsts and a lot of great work uh but after this product uh, it's only uh, made uh, made my life much easier because now we are seeing a flood of product pro- ideas coming from you know, innovation unit and r&d and lately we've been looking at a lot of uh, l- uh, protein language models uh, especially in biologics uh, how can we uh, identify missense mutations or nucleotides uh and that's been a big uh, big work over the last 6 months and i'm pretty sure it's going in the right direction on the protein language models i believe you are talking about the ai ml some fundamental biological large language models that are aware of proteins so um well i don't have, i don't have to tell you about esm i guess that's for sure yeah yeah So yeah, uh, Facebook big model the team got disbanded unfortunately but yeah indeed indeed so uh, you can uh, take that as an example to be honest uh, we were looking at uh, different genes and trying to see the overall uh, uh, missense mutations in in the, in the nucleotide levels so if we have uh, i don't know p53 protein with about 399 nucleotides what happens if you are replacing one of the nucleotides with a possible 21 other nucleotides what would be the impact how does a protein structure a pro- overall protein fold and what would be the impact uh, and this was firstly originated in one university in uk um, don't remember the exact name but still one of the professors reached out to us that's a good story by the way uh, they reached out to us and say hey uh, we did try to uh, stratify patients covid patients based on the variants and it out it worked out to be really well uh, why don't we look into applying it for i don't know uh, different tumors and see how how we can identify the areas or uh, translocations in the uh, for, for for protein binding and so on and so forth and this is something uh, the team is actively working i can't talk too much into the detail but i would probably i'm expecting them to show the results by the end of the year uh last time i heard uh they were very excited uh, about the great results they are getting but let's see how far we go so following that point then you would have some ai ml engineers as part of the team would they be a separate group like the computational biologists or would they be part of the data science bix well we also have a big engineering group just like data science group we also have engineers uh, as part of bix um so our goal is not to keep the product with us uh, our goal is to uh, develop the product um, if possible exchange the knowledge we learn science and the domain and we teach uh, the other way around how do we run the overall product and train people if needed to be uh, and then hand it over back to the uh given business unit so that's what we do uh right now it's a small group uh i believe in small groups working faster rather than throwing i don't know uh, 20 people at it that's not that's not really our style so uh they're doing well uh, but once it comes to a scale up phase we work a lot more on uh how good the product is structured and how good the overall uh, uh it's it's it, it looks in the production and so on and so forth so again with the goal of handing it back to the business unit in this case uh, our computational biology team okay. since 2021 you've been probably seeing how this idea really shaping and 
you know, producing amazing products, internal and external. If you had to extrapolate that to another three years, five years and beyond, how do you think the whole, first of all, the whole space will look like and how will BIX and BI will position and take their place in that space? Well, I would answer on two access to be honest, firstly on drug discovery and AI, and the second one is digital health, I would say, for me, those are the two access which we work on. Um, as you were referring to my post a few a few days ago, uh, yeah. it's, the change is already happening, it's high speed, right? Um, but 67% of the molecules, 65% of molecules are originated in a biotech. Um, and most of these biotechs are using AI as part of their daily uh, game. So as a big farmer, uh, that's number one. Uh, and I don't think this is gonna stop. I think it's gonna be a, a lot more, right? So uh, one of the examples which I generally take was, uh, I think if you take physics, you can pretty much represent physics using mathematics. You can write down any equation and tell a concept about physics. Uh, five years from now or 10 years from now, you'd probably do the same thing for biology using AI or machine learning, as you call it. I, I personally like the word machine learning a lot more. <laughs> so, uh, so machine learning would be that for biology on what mathematics has been there for physics. So that's where we'll be going. Now, is it gonna be a simple uh, path? Not really. I think the biggest challenge is still the data quality and how do you integrate multimodal data? Uh, not only genome expert, genomics, but also spatial transcriptomics, uh, uh, all of these things uh, still need to be cracked. Uh, but I see that it's gonna be mainstream. And I don't think, we still use the word computational biology a lot or computational chemistry. Moving forward, it's only gonna be the case. <laughs> So I don't think uh, five years from now, people are going to graduate saying that I'm a biologist or a computational biologist. There's only going to be one word because uh, people are expecting it to be, uh, people are expecting uh, a biologist to know uh, a lot of machine learning work or do it while they are still in the in university and so on and so forth. So that's how it's going to go. Um, hopefully this will uh, accelerate the development times uh, and also decrease the cost. Yeah. That's number one, and of course, take the uh, take the molecules to the patients faster. With regards to digital health, I think twenty twenty one has been a year with a lot of hype. There was a lot of deals, venture deals, which were happening in the you know digital. <laughs> Over the last one or two years, it's, they've been consolidated, and uh, people are trying to figure out uh, the challenge. Uh, they're self-facing the challenges, especially uh, who's going to pay and what is the evidence that this works and how do you make sure it's sustainable over a period of time? Uh, so these are the big questions that people started asking. Uh, so again, this is my personal opinion. I think it's going to consolidate a bit further. Uh, uh, good ones will still be there and they'll still make... Uh, Good products and therapeutics uh, take therapeutics to the market uh, but a lot of the ones who haven't yet figured out uh, how the overall business model looks like or uh, what is the evidence generation path probably will uh, go down and but that's that's common with any of the hypes which we go through part of the circle yeah good so there are a few questions Maybe I will take those uh, before I switch over back to you uh, for a few final things. So one of them you mentioned about the data quality and maybe also the quantity being one of the bottlenecks. What are your thoughts on the potential solutions for it? <laughs> Good question. And. Uh... I wish there was a simple solution because it's been the, the, the challenge for uh, R&D uh, for a very long time and it, it's still going to be the case. Um, uh, one hope I see is through biobanks, population biobanks. Um, so I think they are, uh, like if you take uh, UKB, there are about half a million samples now or, or uh, 
patient numbers in there. Combining different biobanks across the geographies uh, would probably would be the best case scenario. How would you want to do it? Because different biobanks have different policies, uh, different research questions. So uh, that still remains one of the challenges in the domain. And also back translating, uh, given the sequencing platforms are different, long read, short read, proteomics, genomics, transcriptomics. So these are also the challenges that we have to go through. So uh, short answer, uh, we just have to uh, solve one step, go through one step at a time. I wish, I hope that was an easier answer or solution. And I'm pretty sure everybody in the pharma industry or even life sciences industry would be ecstatic to know that answer. But yeah, there's no easy uh, but that one. So another question I have. People are wondering the difficulties and also the, the solutions you had to develop to bring multiple different groups together to complete that first eight months long internal program. Assuming that people, I mean, obviously your scientists with PhDs within the BIX team understands how the research done, and I'm sure computational biologists understand the data science to an extent, but did you have to go through a, a training, create a new set of commonly understood vocabulary set or something like that? No, <laughs> not really. I think one of the things which worked in our favor was I worked in the domain of genomics for a very long time. So I had to push a bit with my group or, you know, uh, light that fire saying that, hey, I don't have a PhD. Uh, I just have a master's in computer science and statistics. So if I can do it, I'm pretty sure you people who are geniuses can also do it much faster and easier. So, and, and that's a good part about BIX, I would say. Uh, if you're looking at the entire value chain, you should be flexible enough to learn different parts of the business. Uh, you have to be, uh, you, confident and open-minded to learn drug, uh, what happens in drug discovery. Of course, we are not going to be as good as people who are doing it in, you know, for their daily day-to-day uh, -day business. But if you have a good context, what the target is or how the identification works, then it's a good start. And one thing I realized in this journey was once people see this as a challenge, once they get the taste of, oh, hey, I'm learning this new field, I'm making a progress, it's, it's no, you're not going back they just get hooked up and they they enjoy it and it also goes vice versa like the people who are coming from r d they also look at how we work uh, how do we develop models or how do we write code or how do we take it to the production they also enjoy it so uh, so there's a mutual interest overall and a bit of a bit of uh, you know uh, lighting up the fire is generally a good thing to do Another question. So um, this is about one of the things you said earlier in, in the in the session that somebody with an idea that can come to your to the right group at BIX and say that look this is very interesting I want to do it. They have to demonstrate some type of ownership as a product owner or need, you may find one for them. But where does the budget come from? Is it more of a there is an allocated pot for the whole research or it has to be a business case to be made on the translation of that, that project? Um, so a quick clarification, within BIX, we have a group called Ideation and Scouting. They're dedicated people who are uh, working on I finding these ideas and uh, nurturing these ideas and helping people think through these ideas, you know, design thinking, so on and so forth, right? So that's number one. Uh, where does the budget come from? Budget essentially comes from BIX. Mm. So if let's just say you are a scientist who are working in R&D and you have an idea and you have your alignment with your boss or whoever it is uh, saying that, hey, I have this idea, it's brilliant, but I want to work with BIX. So all you have to do is get to BIX, talk to ID and scouting or anybody in, for a matter of fact, and simply say, this is my idea. Um, let, shall we go through uh, you know, a discovery phase to see if it works? And again, I do get ideas all the time. And uh, out of 10, only one or two uh, seems something which I want to move into an MVP. You know, uh, 
So that's exactly what uh, ideation and scouting provides. Mm -hmm. And once we say that, okay, this is our business model canvas, um, the decision ma is made within BIX. We don't have to ask anyone. We have the budget, we put together a team, uh, go for it. And that was a whole concept of BIX to remove any of the uh, red tape or bureaucracy. Uh, you have the idea, you have the right people, just go run with it. That's a great setup, almost like multiple startups in a big pharma, in a way. Um, there are a few other questions, but maybe we'll keep them uh, for another time. And I can pass all of those to Nikhil and your contact details, people, and then uh, then you can take it from there. So, Nikhil, back to you. Um, any closing remarks, any questions or a call to action for the audience might be partnerships, recruitment or something else? Sure. Um, I mentioned, I uh, talked a lot about ideas which are coming with him, uh, within the company, but it is not the only way to work with VIX. So we also look at outside world, uh, open innovation, we also ask for a collaboration from startups or academia or even uh, a research which has at the TRL level, in the early TRL levels, right? So you can, if there's something which is uh, interesting and which might be useful in the domain of digital health or pharma, uh, please reach out. We are always looking for right partners and well, even if the idea doesn't go forward, it's always good to have a conversation over coffee and get to know each other. So uh, please reach out and we are always open to uh, such a discussion. What's the best way to reach out to you? So we have, a, I can provide the email ID. Actually, it's directly goes to our ideation and scouting. They are the overall responsible folks and they will, they're very fast. They will respond uh, to any kind of queries or any kind of proposals coming from the uh, uh, or a partner ecosystem. Well, on that note, uh, we thank you, Nikhil, on behalf of the, the audience and the whole community. Thank you very much for coming and joining us and sharing your experience. Thank you so much, Murat. It was great to talk to you and uh, I enjoyed the session as well. Perfect. Um, we will now break to the uh, breakout room and for the audience, Today, because of some time pressure, we'll have to unfortunately skip the uh, networking session. But um, everybody's communication, if you are willing, will be distributed. So uh, please feel free to reach out to Nikhil. Okay, thank you. Bye now.